Well, uh, there once was a little girl. She was adorable, and I took her to the theater and to serendipity afterward, and she never forgot it, and she never forgot the chocolate stuff at serendipity. And it turns out that Tatiana von Furstenberg is our other honoree tonight, a grown-up woman who lives mostly in Los Angeles. She is the daughter of the famous, famous, super famous Diane von Furstenberg and a Furstenberg prince who was charm itself. This honoree, grown-up, is the lucky stepdaughter of a doting stepfather named Barry Diller. Are we in the right ballpark here? I mean, these people are incredible with their generosity. In spite of being born to talent, fame, a title, and an eventual fortune, Tatiana has become an artist herself. She is a philanthropist committed to culture and giving to giving independent artists a chance. And you know where art is in the spectrum of today. She worked at Steinberg and Sons. She co-designed a mixed media art show at the alleged gallery in New York. She's now into filmmaking, everybody's dream. And she co-wrote and directed a movie called Tatter Hall that was seen at the Toronto Film Festival. And her latest is called Tyrolean Riviera, just finished shooting in Austria. She studied modern culture and media and comparative lit at Brown and did all of those good things that you're hoping your children will do or your grandchildren and she worked in applied psychology at NYU. She is alarmingly bicoastal. We salute her honoring the arts. The arts are a step up from learning to read and write. And we are, of course, of course grateful that she oversees and is the young director for the Diller von Furstenberg Family Foundation, which supports nearly every move I make. So I am grateful. And the motto here is, be nice to little children of your friends. You never know. We welcome, <laughs> we welcome Tatiana von Furstenberg on her own talents, and she is our other honoree tonight, one of Shakespeare's queens, Tatiana von Furstenberg. Thank you. Goodbye, my, my darling. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Well, I know a little bit about writing, reading and I know something about teaching it. I tutored a few elementary school students while I was at Brown, and then I went on to teach English at summer school. It was a mixed age high school class. A few students were 19 and 20 years old, and they were not performing well enough academically to move forward to the next grade. I formed a very close relationship with one of these girls who I was told was not English speaking. This turned out to be untrue. She'd been born in Rhode Island and had always lived there, moving through the public school system. But she was shy and defeated and didn't trust that she could tell anyone that it was a struggle for her to read. So she pretended and withdrew and carried with her what she thought was a shameful secret. We worked together and we found some precocious early reader books because in every other area of her life, she was an adult and the material must be compelling in order to develop a love of reading. There were other kids too, but what struck me about her was how once she put down the emotions of fear, shame, and secrecy, it was a straight and very determined line to thriving. 
Many young children are not able to coordinate the use of a pencil and envision the spelling at the same time. Maria Montessori's applications are all about isolating each skill set. I watch my daughter and her classmates sound out words and spell fluently by putting down wooden letters. Learning how to spell is very different than learning how to write. And removing the stress of holding a pencil and forming letters is incredibly effective. We know all of this, but somehow the systems that get pushed forward are not necessarily the ones that work. Anyway, I'm not a literacy expert, but I do read and write every day, nearly compulsively. Writing and communication has been my life force. I write when I want to get clear about something. It's the relationship that I have with myself. It's the tool that grounds me. It's through writing that I've created my most effective communication, driving my work life, securing that I'm heard and seen in my relationships, and also it's a vehicle for my playfulness and my imagination. When I worked at the Daily News after college, an editor taught me never to use an adverb and to be deliberate and specific. If an adjective has to be qualified, search for a more precise one that conveys more. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was a very useful takeaway because adjectives are so incredibly powerful. As a director, aside from conceiving ideas, the mandate of my job is to clearly convey my intention to the actors, to the costume designer, to the art director, etc. These department's heads and their crews will manifest my invisible ideas, and it's only through precision of adjectives that the world will become unified and will materialize as a whole. Reading memoirs, I don't know if I should even say this, but anyway, reading memoirs is another important part of my daily life. I love to connect with another human experience it feeds me. I was born with a muscle condition that makes it impossible for me to get lost in the liberating world of physical activity. But I have had the abundant privilege of being able to read and experience so much through reading. And I've had the privilege of a solid education that emphasized and schooled me in communication. For many years, I was tangled up in the shame and negative emotions around my physical disability. It's paralyzing and dark to be stuck in that place. Let's be accepting of one another's differences. We all have them. Without the shame, the secrecy, the fear, and the judgment, it would be natural to ask for help and to get the support you need to learn to read. Thank you for asking me to be here tonight and to Literacy Partners <clears throat> for being inclusive, welcoming, encouraging, and for being of service to so many people. Thank you. Let's go to Sarah <laughs> Before before we <laughs> can I pick them? <laughs> <laughs>